The oscillators we've dealt with up to now have all had that in common, that their oscillations persist indefinitely without any reduction in amplitude. In some cases, this can actually be a realistic situation. For instance, when you're dealing with the quantum mechanical oscillators at a microscopic level. But if we're dealing with mechanical oscillators that are large, uh, then they will always undergo some damping and eventually come to a stop. And that's the case that we're going to treat here. So let's say that we have, uh, again, our uh, mass on a string, and that represents uh, the oscillator that we're going to work with. We have, uh, at some point in time, we'll have a velocity, x dot, of this, uh, of this mass. And we're going to add now a damping force that will cause the oscillator to come to a rest. Now, there are many different ways you could do that in principle, uh, but we already know one which is particularly easy, and that's to have a force that is linear in the velocity, linear drag. Uh, we know that in that case, everything becomes linear. All the differential equations become linear, and we can solve the uh, uh, equations relatively easily. So let's say that we have here um, a drag force, and that this drag force is minus b v in the direction of the velocity. So if that's the case, then we can write down Newton's second law for this system, which says now that uh, we have the mass times the acceleration is equal to all the forces that are acting on the um, acting on the mass. So we first have the restoring force minus kx, and then we have minus bv. Now, the velocity is just the first time derivative opposition, and acceleration is the second one. So we get that mx double dot, moving everything over on one side also to make it, uh, to give it a standard form. Then we get this. Okay. Now we're going to introduce uh, this damping constant, beta, which I'm going to set equal to b over 2m. So if I take this equation now and divide by m, I get x double dot plus b over m x dot plus k over m x equals to zero. Uh, we can then substitute the b over m with, uh, well, we're going to get two beta, right? And k over m, uh, we already know from the undamped case that that's going to be equal to omega naught squared. So we end up then with this equation of motion. There. Now, this factor of 2 here um, will come in handy later when we define things. It will make some definitions a little simpler. You should be aware, though, that not every text uses that. So sometimes you will just see a beta there, and that means that this beta is not uh, uniquely defined. So just keep in mind that the beta that we are using relies on this particular definition. Um, I'm going to also call omega naught the natural frequency. So that's the frequency at which this oscillator oscillates in the absence of drag. We already know that. We don't know exactly what's going to happen here, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll find out in a minute. So this is now a linear second order differential equation. Um, and one way to solve these is to what's known as the method of the characteristic equation or the auxiliary equation. And that corresponds to just simply saying that, okay, I'm going to posit that solutions, at least some of the solutions to this equation, will have this form, e to the rt. So that means that x dot 
that's going to be rx and x double dot well that will be r squared x so if i plug that in there uh, i will get r squared x plus 2 beta r x plus omega naught squared x equals 0 and then we can just divide out all the x's and we end up with and this is the auxiliary equation okay and that's just a second order uh, second order equation and we can solve that fairly easily uh, we find that r here equals minus beta plus minus the square root of beta squared minus omega naught squared. You can verify that for yourself. In other words, we have two independent solutions. And that's comforting because we have a second order differential equation that's linear. We know we should have two independent solution and two independent solutions. And we know that the general solution is just the sum of, of those two solutions. So uh, what we get here, um, we call this r plus minus, is that x of t is going to be some constant c1 times e to the r plus t plus some other constant c2 times r minus times t. So this is the general solution. And again, we can say this because we're dealing with a second order linear differential equation. Okay, so if you just plug in then the, the r's here, um, we'll see that this is just equal to e to the minus beta t times c1 Hope that isn't too hard to, to read here, but underneath the square root here, it says oh, beta squared minus omega naught squared. It's the same as, as this square root here. So this is the most general solution. Okay. Um, now, what we're going to do next is we're going to look at this equation in a few different cases. It turns out that there are uh, different behaviors depending on uh, the relative size of, of beta and omega, and then we'll see this now. So the first case we're going to consider is the case of no damping at all. In other words, beta equals to zero. If we do that, uh, we immediately get the solution. X of t is just and that's because the square root of minus omega naught squared is i omega naught, right? Uh, so that's, so we recover in this limit of no damping uh, the solution we have seen before. So this is as expected. Uh, but it's good to, to know that we can do this sanity check too, to see that things look okay so far anyway. All right, the next case is the case of weak damping. Weak damping is what we call it when beta is less than omega naught. So if you look at the, um, the solutions here to the characteristic equation, we can see that if beta is less than omega naught, then this root is imaginary. Okay, so under those circumstances, um, we have that beta squared minus omega naught squared is less than zero, which means that we can now identify omega one as the square root of omega naught squared minus beta squared. And if we made that uh, identification, then we can see immediately that these roots here, r plus minus, equals minus beta plus minus i omega 1. 
right? So if we take this now and plug it in here, then uh, what we get is that the solution looks as follows. X of t is e to the minus beta t, and then that multiplies something that looks very much uh, like uh, the solution to the undamped case. The difference, though, here is that the, uh, uh, the, the frequency of oscillation is given by this expression. Right? So it's not quite omega naught, it's some square root of omega naught minus beta squared. So actually, this oscillates, but at a slightly lower frequency than the undamped oscillator. And also we can see that the amplitude here decays over time. So as time goes by, the amplitude becomes smaller and smaller of the oscillator, it starts out moving uh, a lot, and then the motion damps out, which is exactly what we'd expect, right? In fact, we can say that the amplitude falls off by a factor of e in the time 1 over beta. So beta is a damping constant, and we can see here that it actually has the unit of inverse frequency, uh, of inverse time or, or, or frequency. So to make this a little clearer, I'm going to write this as a times e to the minus beta t, which then multiplies cosine of omega 1 t minus delta. Right, so this is the amplitude, which decreases exponentially in time, which is then multiplied by this oscillation. Let's now look at the mathematic problem that shows this. I'm just going to move over this solution here to the left. So this is the Bathematica program. Here we have, as before, uh, the position of the uh, uh, oscillator and its velocity in different colors. And this is the phase plot plotting velocity on the y-axis and position on the x-axis. And I also decided to, to plot um, energy here as a function of time. So if we now just turn time on, then the oscillator starts to oscillate. We have the, the motion of the oscillator back and forth around the equilibrium. The velocity is 90 degrees off from, uh, from the position. And if you write down the energy, the energy is constant. Right? And we can you know, change the initial conditions a little bit, but that doesn't change anything. Okay, so this is the case of no damping. It looks just like we expect. Now let's turn on the damping, just a little bit like that, and now we get this effect. So we can see here that we have an oscillation, and we also see that the amplitude decays exponentially over time. In the phase plot, we have the behavior of a spiral that spirals in towards the, the fixed point here at the center where the oscillator is at rest uh, at the equilibrium point. And we can also see when we, we uh, plot the energy here versus time that the energy decreases uh, as time goes by. So that is intuitively, I think, kind of what we'd expect. Uh, and the more damping we... Uh, the more damping we apply, the faster the uh, the oscillator damps out. Right. And this is no damping at all. So that's the case of weak damping, and there are a couple of other cases which we'll deal with in the next video. Uh, for now, though, I'm going to just leave you with a question, uh, which you can perhaps ponder. Uh, if you look here at the energy, you can see that it decreases over time, but it doesn't dec decrease as an exponential. There are wiggles here along the uh, along the path, uh, along the plot. So the question is, why does the energy not decay uh, exponentially? What's the origin of these wiggles? 
and you can show mathematically that they should be there, but what I want is a physical explanation for why it is that the rate of decay in the energy of the oscillator varies periodically in time like this.